three dimensions. In three dimensions, what we, uh, what we showed is that if we have the color code with point-like excitations, uh, it will be equivalent to the copies of the Tori code attached <coughs> along one of the boundaries. So in principle, uh, so in practice, in three dimensions, if we have the color code on a tetrahedron, it would be equivalent to three, uh, almost the couple copies of the Tori code. And these three copies of the Tori code are attached along the base. And to discuss the uh, relation between the color code and the Tori code, it is uh, very insightful to look at uh, anionic um, excitations in these two models and how they condense on their boundaries. Um, so in particular, if we have the, uh, the patch of the Tori code with two rough and two smooth boundaries, we could have an electric excitation in the bulk and magnetic excitation in the bulk. And now um, we also know that if we have ions which condense on a gap boundary, uh, then they must have uh, mutually trivial statistics. So what it means for the Tori code is that if we have an electric excitation E which condenses on the rough edge, then the magnetic edge, uh, then the magnetic excitation cannot condense there because E and M, the braiding uh, of E and M results with minus one phase. But magnetic excitation can condense on the smooth edge. So now let's uh, have a look at what, uh, what's the story when we fold the Tori code. Um, then what we can have is, uh, let me denote by E1, the electric charge in the front layer, by M2, the magnetic charge in the rear layer. So note that I can drag uh, E1 to the right edge because there is the rough boundary here, but I can also drag M2 to the uh, right edge because there is smooth boundary in the rear layer. So um, I can identify this edge with, um, with the set of anions which condense on it, uh, namely E1 and M2. And this would be an edge um, having uh, rough and smooth boundaries. Uh, similarly, I can identify the top edge with uh, E2 and M1. This would be smooth boundary on the top of rough boundary. But how about the, the uh, fold, the diagonal edge? Um, well, imagine I have E1 in the front layer and E2 in the rear layer. If I were to bring them together to the fold, it would be the same as uh, annihilating two electric charges inside in the bulk of the toric. So um, uh, this edge will be identified with E1 and E2 and M1, M2. So um, the inside, the take home message from uh, the slide is that there would be a correspondence between uh, anionic uh, labels uh, of the toric code and the color code. And, uh, uh, in a few uh, last minutes, I, have, I would like to tell you about our third result, which is how to implement a non-Clifford unitary <coughs> in the uh, Tori code. So um, let me uh, start with uh, repeating the result of Bravi and Koenig, which says that if we have a topological stabilizer code in the dimensions, what we could hope for to achieve <coughs> is only gates from the div level of the Clifford hierarchy uh, if, we, if our quantum circuits are of constant depth. So uh, let's have a look at the Clifford hier hierarchy uh, now. So it's defined recursively. Uh, first level is the Pauli group. Uh, second level is the Clifford group. And in general, the Jth level will be the set of all unitaries which take Paulis and map them to the J minus 1 level. And two examples of gates in the Dth level of the Clifford hierarchy is the um, phase gate, Rd, so it introduces this phase E to the power of 2 pi i over 2 to the power of d. And uh, d qubit uh, controlled z gate, which introduces minus 1 phase if and only if all qubits are in one, uh, in one state. And so uh, let me recall uh, this result that the color code in the dimensions has transversely implementable logical uh, Rd gate. And uh, so far, what we've seen is that the color code and the Tori code are really related. So uh, how about the Tori code? Can we say about some uh, gates from the div level of the Clifford hierarchy? And um, what I will try to explain to you uh, really quickly is how to implement a d qubit control z gate with the Tori code. So um, to do that, I would need to, uh, I would need to uh, consider the color code with boundaries on a d-dimensional hypercube. Such a code would have uh, the logical qubits. So um, as an example, uh, let's consider the color code on the uh, square patch 
with boundaries of two colors, one color and the other color, such a color code would have two logical qubits. And um, it turns out that this, uh, this square um, color code with boundaries is equivalent to two copies of the toric code with boundaries, each of uh, which has exactly one logical qubit. In particular, in the dimensions, I would have um, the uh, copies of the dimensional toric code on the uh, uh, d-dimensional hypercubes. So uh, what now I can imagine of doing is, what, can I, what I can think of doing is, I can start with my d copies of the toric code, and I will apply uh, a certain unitary, u uh, r, uh, r uh, u dagger. And this would be a local unitary. So uh, remember, uh, this u here is the u which uh, maps my color code on the hypercube onto the decoupled copies of the toric code. And um, what such a unitary does is it starts with the copies of the toric code. It maps up back, u dagger ma maps us back to the color code setting. Then we apply uh, u, uh, r, uh, d phase gate uh, transversely everywhere to each and every qubit here. And then u maps us back to the toric code setting. And what we checked is that uh, such a local unitary indeed implements a gate from the diff level of the Clifford hierarchy, which is the um, d qubit control z gate. And um, what this result uh, tells us is that the d copies of the toric code do saturate uh, the Bravikini classification. So it's not only that the color code is magical and it's the only example known to saturate the Bravikini classification. Uh, there is also uh, the good old toric code which saturates the classification. And with that, I would like to uh, summarize my talk. So I try to explain to you uh, three results of ours. So uh, in the case of no boundaries, the color code is equivalent to multiple decoupled copies of the toric code. In the case of boundaries, the color code can be thought of as uh, some sort of folded toric code. And I also um, explain to you how one can implement a non-Clifford gate, a d qubit um, control z gate in d copies of the toric code. And one can implement this gate with a, a local unitary transformation. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. We have time for a few questions. Uh, I guess I have uh, two questions. So my first question has to do with surfaces without boundaries. So the famous surface classification theorem tells us that the set of all surfaces isn't just things with handles, but can also have cross caps as well. And while it might seem exotic to think of codes on surfaces that are not orientable, it's really not all that exotic. For example, if you put the surface code on the projective plane, you get the shore code. And the shore code is a very simple code that we often teach first to our students. So I was wondering if you had a, an understanding of what it meant. So my first question is, <laughs> uh, is there a classification of uh, color codes or, or toric codes on non-orientable surfaces or surfaces with cross caps and relating them back and forth? And my second question, try to remember the first one too, is uh, when you talk about uh, systems with boundaries, we typically talk about squares for the toric code and triangles for the color code. But in fact, uh, the toric code, when, put, ha when it has boundaries, can just have all it has to have is an even number of edges, and the color code just needs to have a multiple of three number of edges. And it's not clear, and while it's, you, cleverly you can fold a, you know, a square into a triangle, it's not clear to me how you fold an octagon into some collection of triangles and hexagons or something like that. So do you have an understanding? Okay, so can you classify uh, systems with more general boundaries as well? All right, so thanks for the questions. Um, with the non-orientable surfaces, um, I, I'm not sure how to, how to do it. Um, what I was thinking of um, is basically orientable surfaces, you know, like um, tessellations which are kind of um, not pathological. Um, but uh, and I can comment on the second question. So um, when it comes to the color code, um, you can have uh, basically an arbitrary number of boundaries. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be three. Um, it, you can consider the color code, uh, which is on the triangular patch, uh, but you can have boundaries, for instance, of two alternating colors. And then as long as uh, your color code, let's say in two dimensions, uh, as long as the boundaries of your color code uh, are of only two colors, so the third color is not present, then you can map it 
into two decoupled copies of the Toric code. Uh, if you have all three colors on your boundary, then you cannot really decouple them all together. They will be always attached along one of the colors. And um, then, uh, the, um, then this catchy phrase you know, of unfolding color code is not, uh, not, uh, not anymore true, because uh, you don't really unfold it. It's, you should think of it more like there are two copies, the, uh, decoupled copies of the Toric code, but at, um, at some boundaries where, are, uh, where they are identified. I see. Thank you. Somebody has a really quick question. Yeah, I have one. Uh, so, um, is this sorted? Yeah. Um, usually, these results are easily generalizable to QDITs, mm -hmm. so to QDIT color codes. Did you think about it? Because I think it maps probably quite easily to the QDIT setting. Um, yeah, probably. Although, um, what uh, what we did is for the qubit case. All right. Thanks.